things. So uh, we'll talk a bit about a product called Introspec. Uh, Viswesh and I were colleagues at a startup called Niara, uh, founded here in the Valley in Sunnyvale in 2013. We were acquired by Aruba in 2017, which is how both of us and Introspec arrived here. The importance of this in the context of this discussion is that it represents two key uh, and in, uh, critical technology and solution strategies for Aruba. One is security, and the second is AI and machine learning. So it, I'll leave most of the slides as backup for you uh, because we want to get to a, uh, a demo. Uh, but one of the slides talks about a, a survey that we did with over uh, 3,500 security professionals asking them about what kinds of inside threats, threats that get past all the different security infrastructure that they have, what are they worried about most? And the three things that came up were compromised users and devices, you go to the wrong website, you open up the wrong email, uh, negligent users, I've shared my password with somebody else, and then the third that showed up was IoT. And that's a new um, report uh, as far as the data that we've seen, and it reflects back on some of the things we've, we've discussed today, and we'll talk a bit about how Introspect has a major role in dealing with IoT security. Very quickly is a flyover of how the product is organized and the architecture. We start with harvesting as much IT activity for a user, a system, or a device as possible. And how we do that, and this is a bit unique to this class of product, is we can look at network traffic and logs. And network traffic starts with packets. And we have our own deep packet inspection engine whose mission is to harvest out of the packet flows the features for the machine learning for the analytics. We also look at NetFlow and a wide variety of log sources. The whole idea is to build a profile of activity for a user or a system or a device and look for anomalies that could indicate an attack is underway. So the other piece of the product, the other key technology obviously is the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, we use two types of machine learning, supervised and unsupervised, and in fact, Many of the algorithms and models that we just discussed in the Wi-Fi context, we use in the security context as well, which illustrates a key point that we believe is very important about AI and ML, which is while the algorithms and the data science are important, there's a whole stack of capabilities that you have to bring to make a successful solution out of these technologies. It includes domain expertise, access to data to do training, Maturity in the sense of being able to expose your results to the real world and make the adjustments you need so that they're effective. So uh, what Viswesh is going to demonstrate is a lot of learnings that we've had over the five years of how AI and machine learning can solve security problems. So net with that, I will turn it over to him. Viswesh. Thank you, Larry. Um, I'll quickly fire up the two demo systems that I'm going to use to... Uh, showcase some of these features. So as an introduction, uh, to, to, uh, to elaborate further on what Larry just said, it takes a lot of effort to build a mature application when you use AI. And what do I mean by that? Let's start with the basic definition of machine learning. Uh, since we talk a lot about it, we still haven't defined it. It's really about bringing the power of computer systems to solve problems that have traditionally required human intelligence. And so, when we bring AI to a problem, we still want to keep the human in the loop when it comes to security applications. All we want to do is to remove a lot of the drudgery, but the focus with a tool like Introspect is around improving the efficiency of the SOC team, because ultimately, you still need the human being at the end to decide what's important. Now, if you look at security tools in general over the last several years, what you might have seen is there's always a quandary between making the right kinds of trade-offs between false positives, which are alerts and insights that you create, which are not really real, and false negatives, which are real incidents that you don't alert on. And classically, tools have taken the side of reducing the number of false positives while letting a lot of real alerts get by. For a 24 by 7 monitoring application, our, the trade-offs that we have applied are very different. We want to catch the faintest signal using our machine learning techniques. And then we also want to apply machine learning and other traditional techniques to collect all these individual small signals to create one big signal. 
And so in our portfolio, we use machine learning and also a lot of other traditional techniques like chaining these individual alerts using temporal rules and such to create high fidelity, small number of events. So in the demo that I'll show you now, I want to focus on how we reduce the noise in the processing of these alerts, how we separate the wheat from the chaff. So the first thing that we do is, is to decorate the insights that we create from machine learning using two important metrics. The first question an analyst would ask is, of all these different types of alerts that you have created, when these are alerts of the same type, say for example, an anomalous data upload into Dropbox by somebody in the enterprise, how do you tell the difference between the seriousness of these two different alerts? For that, we create a metric called confidence. Uh, this is really re relying on some of the underlying statistical techniques to say which one is more dependable. So that gives you a sense of how to prioritize investigations of two different alerts of the same type. The next question you might have is, how do I now prioritize two different alerts of different types, say a large anomalous upload to Dropbox versus an excessive logon failure? In that case, we also decorate the alerts with something called um, severity, which, is, which captures the business risk posed by that alert were it to be true. So let me quickly show you what that means. Over here, what you see is all the users in the enterprise who have been prioritized based on their risk score, which I'll get to you in a minute. Uh, but if I click on this user, Michelle Johnson, and I click on one of the alerts that have been raised for Michelle Johnson, you can see that it has been annotated with a score of 60 for severity, that's the business risk, a score of 100 for confidence. But stepping back, even if I have all these annotations, how do I now compare different users in that same environment who have all been flagged using machine learning? I still need to know the difference between Michelle Johnson and somebody else. To do that, we have again used machine learning to calculate what's called a risk score, which is a common yardstick that will allow you to compare users, devices, IP addresses, using a hidden Markov model that tracks the accumulation of alerts, the spread of alerts over different types of attacks, the most severe alerts seen by that user, and so on. And what you're seeing here on the screen is a plot of the risk score over the last month for that user. So as you can tell, we have boiled down the behaviors of that user using machine learning into individual alerts. And then we have annotated those alerts with severity and confidence. And then using all of that, we have boiled it all down to a single number called the risk score, which you can now depend on to investigate and prioritize your investigations. The next thing that I want to show you is even if I give you this wonderful insight into some type of behavior, machine learning still does not give you all the contextual forensics information that you might need to now go investigate that alert. So along with generating these alerts, a tool like this also needs to now show you all the data that you might now need to go investigate this alert. So for example, if I go to all the individual network conversations that led to this type of alert, with a single click of a button, you can get all the detailed network sessions. We retain this data for many, many weeks so that whenever you see an alert, you can quickly capture all the underlying network conversations or logs that led to that anomaly uh, discovered by the product. You can dig deeper and examine all the individual details that was extracted in terms of metadata for that alert. Now the good news is that this data comes to us through logs, network packets, and also when we integrate with other products within the Aruba portfolio. So for example, every AP that you have generates a log from its firewall, which captures all the uploaded bytes, downloaded bytes, source and destination IP ports, so that by very quick integration with AP, with almost zero deployment of net new hardware, you can capture all these insights by integrating with the Amon feed, as it's called, from a wireless access point. 
said you were collecting like syslogs. And yes. Can, does it have to be an Aruba product to collect that syslog, or could you point any part of your network? So could you point the syslogs from it to this and then have it just do the same thing? Sure. So the question is, you know, what kinds of sources can I connect to this product? So we can take data from all the major SIM vendors. So it's stored inside in their proprietary format or in a well-established format through API. We can take that. We can natively connect to security devices out there, web gateways, email gateways, and take syslog. We also build a packet processor that can sit off your tap or span port on your switch to take native packets, uh, raw Ethernet packets, and then we extract the metadata from those packets. We can take in NetFlows, uh, any other types of session records that you might have. We also ingest third-party alerts, so we don't claim to find all the alerts ourselves. So you can find the behavioral alerts using this tool, and then other alerts found by other methods so that they all together inform the same risk score that I just talked about. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about is when you have a lot of anomalies generated by machine learning algorithms, not every anomaly is malicious or suspicious. So how do you now tell the difference? So to do that, we have provided ways to cluster alerts so that you can collect multiple different alerts with a common signature. So these kinds of techniques have been used in other domains that you might have run into. So retail merchants, when you shop something online, they often tell you uh, other users who have bought these products have also purchased. Uh, what that means is they have done some amount of data mining through all the uh, purchase orders and grouped purchases with a common characteristic. We apply similar techniques uh, to uh, security alerts. So as an example, now I might have to switch to a different uh, demo system here, just because that's a, uh, sorry, one second. Let me quickly switch to Cambria. So let me quickly show you how we cluster alerts. So for example, if I were to scroll down and uh, pick, say, all the different alerts that have been generated in the system and click on, say, everything that says Dropbox, or I'm just going to click on something that I find quickly. So you can see for any large internal data download that is anomalous in your enterprise, of the 22 different alerts that were created, 12 of them, the card that you can see right over here, it says the app ID was HTTP, the username was the same, and the department was the same, and the destination address that all these requests were going to were the same. So now I've performed data mining to collect all similar alerts together so that rather than investigating one anomaly at a time, I present an entire batch for efficiency reasons. So you can look at the entire batch and with a single click, apply the analyst feedback. Another example of machine learning is great for the individual anomalies, but you still have to mature the product with important user workflows that allow you to now consume the insights of that machine learning with great ease. And so that's the kinds of learning that we have accumulated over the several years after we first introduced machine learning into our product. And from what I can see in the marketplace, there are many startups who will start using machine learning, but they still haven't provided the kinds of workflows that allow you to digest all these insights. They provide sort of very bare bones machine learning to, uh, to identify these anomalies, but then you are left with having to sort through all the noise and figure out which are the more meaningful ones. So this is an example for you know, how we have made it easy for the user to consume this in the specific example of a security analytics platform. So with the workflow, um, instead of someone having to actually look at it, can, if you have clear pass, I'm assuming, you can send out yes. automated Absolutely. Actions? So we have done that integration, starting with uh, two releases in the past. So that integration does exist. So what that does is we send ClearPass on a periodic basis. Every time there is an alert, we send the risk score, we send the details of the alert type that triggered, and then you can use the policy framework in ClearPass to decide what you want to do with that user. And typically that involves 
uh, kicking that device off the network if it matches the policy and forcing a reauthentication and upon which you apply the right kind of policy, which means maybe moving them to a different VLAN, limiting the rate at which they access information, limiting the servers they get access to and so on. So that integration does exist and it's also being deployed today by some uh, customers, especially for IoT use cases. Is it only ever going to be ClearPass, or are you going to integrate with other firewalls, uh, other NACs, other so, security tools? So, uh, so it doesn't restrict us to ClearPass alone. ClearPass by itself has got a very good integration in a broad ecosystem of other tools in the environment. So for now, we rely on ClearPass to do that other communication, whether it's going and installing a rule in a firewall or not. But direct integration with Introspect from another NAC can be done just as easily. We haven't quite done that yet. Okay. What about any sort of API integration or automated yeah. reporting? Absolutely. So we do have automated reporting in the tool itself where through email notifications, you can configure it to say, for these types of alerts at this periodicity, inform these email end users. And so the, email, the report will automatically go out to them. And API access? API access also does exist, uh, and so that's one of the methods by which we would perform the integration with other NAC vendors, but we haven't done it yet. Okay, very good, thank you. These queries here, are those some, is that something you define, or is that the machine saying, I see a large down? Great idea, so you know, uh, let me give you an example. So if I pick this particular card, where we have automatically extracted that specific query that matched all those alerts, and if I now want to make that an exception, which means tell the tool not to raise an alert of this kind ever again in the near future because it's just noise, when I do that, you will see that I've automatically pre-populated that query, which means the user did not have to type a single line. But is that query something that initially was created by the machine? Yeah, yeah, created by the machine. Create? No, nothing here was done by a human. Everything was self-discovered, self-learned. All you had to do is to click and then apply. Okay. So one last piece I want to show you is uh, what we refer to as a higher order analytics. So most tools will give you the first order anomalies, and then you have to figure out what to do with them. But the real power comes when you are able to say something like, detect an anomalous download from a finance server, and then look for an anomalous email that was sent out, maybe with a abnormal attachment size. Now, how do I connect multiple alerts to tell a bigger story. And so do, to do that, we have introduced a feature called chained alerts. It's essentially being able to couple alerts using temporal operators by saying, first look for A, within some two day or two hour or three week window, look for B. Between A and B, you might see a C, make sure you don't see a D, so on and so forth. So how do you say all these things? Here's an example of how you would do it. Uh, you can configure your own use case that builds upon the first order analytics already discovered by the system. So when I create a new use case, I can say build me a chained alert. And so when you look at this model that just popped up on the screen, you are now allowed to build that sequence of alerts that you care about. So I won't go through all the configuration parameters above, uh, to save time, but when you want to build that sequence, you can now pick individual alerts by category. So in this case, by account activity, I might pick pick the case of an account being locked out, add to that sequence. Now add a group, because sometimes you don't want things to be so perfectly configured to cause what people refer to as overfitting. Uh, you want the rules to be a little bit loose so that you're able to capture a generic combination of things. So in that case, you can even say, insert a sequence member, which is not an individual alert, but rather a group where you say, if you find three out of these five alerts, that's fine. And what you might do is put three or four different types belonging to the same type, whether it's lateral movement, infection, uh, data exfiltration, so on. And so you might say, it's okay to find any one of these three, and that's good enough. So you can build sequences in a very flexible fashion uh, to create these higher order alerts. Have you, have you found that users of this who have put it on get um, overwhelmed 
and, and end up have, having so much notification that they revert back to just not doing anything with it anyway? So yes and no. Uh, as I said, our bias is to show you even the faintest signal. But we do not recommend the end user to chase each one of those faint signals. And so in the early phases of the product, before we had the second order analytics, it would take a lot of time to process them. But as we have added these workflows that simplify the process so that you can focus on a small handful of things, no, we don't find people signing off. It's not like IPS where you know it's the checkbox item, people start ignoring alerts. It's not the case at all. If people find it difficult to consume, they come back to us, and that's when we improve the workflows to do that. Do you, if I put this in my enterprise, yes. do I have to go through that same learning cycle, or can I learn from someone else's learning cycle? Absolutely. So what we have done is, quickly, uh, I'm out of time? Yeah. Oh, sorry. So quick, uh, last, last answer. So what we have done is, rather than require you to build these chained alerts yourself, we have pre-populated the system when it ships with a lot of sample reference chained alerts that you can use directly. All the use cases we ship with more than 100 different use cases that you don't have to configure. You just turn it on, and it starts running. But it gives you the freedom and the flexibility to go modify it if you need to.